Namaste. So the next few verses of Aparokshanubhuti deal with the state of enlightenment. When one realizes that everything is Atman, everything is consciousness, everything we experience, see, feel, hear, and touch, and so on, is all simply consciousness, simply Brahman. And in that state, there's no suffering, no lamentation, no desires. In that state, when one realizes all as identified with the Atman, there arises neither delusion nor sorrow in consequence of the absence of duality. The Shruti, in the form of the Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad, has declared that this Atman, which is the self of all, is verily Brahman. This world, though an object of our daily experience and serving all practical purposes, is, like the dream world, of the nature of non-existence, inasmuch as it is contradicted the next moment. The dream experience is unreal in waking, whereas the waking experience is absent in dream. Both, however, are non-existent in deep sleep, which again is not experienced in either. Thus, all the three states are unreal inasmuch as they are the creation of the three gunas, but their witness, the reality behind them, is beyond all gunas, eternal, one, and is consciousness itself. So in this state of self-realization, there is no more suffering. There is no one to suffer. There is only Brahman. And Brahman is above all. Different kinds of suffering, experience, existence, qualities, changes, and so on. This is the state that we're aiming for. It's described in Bhagavad Gita. Yogo yukta prasanatma, na sochati na kankshati. That one who is united with Brahman in the state of yoga, which means connection, linking, uh, neither laments nor desires to have anything. Na sochati na kankshati. So again, this state of enlightenment is described in negative terms, even in Vedic literatures. Although we use the name Brahman, what we're really talking about is the absence of all duality. And as we've been discussing in the last few episodes, duality is illusion. It's simply an appearance in Brahman. Duality doesn't really exist. Illusion itself is illusory. So what does exist and what is real is only the self, Brahman, consciousness. And we know that consciousness to be divided into three states, waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. But this is when consciousness connects with the three modes of material nature, goodness, passion, and ignorance. This is not consciousness in its native form. That is called Turiya. That original consciousness, which is the basis of the other three, which is not attached or influenced by the modes. And because of that, it's transcendental. And this is the state to which we aspire. This is the state we want to realize. This is the state beyond all suffering. <clears throat> because there's no one to suffer. There's no individual anymore. There's no one who is subject to karma. There's no one to desire anything. There's no one to gain or lose or change or be 
uh, subject to birth and death. There is only Brahman. And Brahman is eternal, ever existing, omniscient, omnipresent. Because Brahman is dimensionless, without measure, without boundaries, therefore it's simultaneously smaller than the smallest and greater than the greatest. This is also discussed in Bhagavad Gita and in many other places in the Vedas. So Brahman is really impossible to describe, but it's not impossible to realize. To do that, all we have to do is stop identifying with duality, to view this phenomenal world and all of its qualities and changes as something separate from the self. That's called discrimination, viveka. And that's the first step in meditation. That's why in Raja Yoga and also in the Tantras, the higher Tantras anyway, that meditation is described as meditation on the void, meditation on space. And in the Buddhist teaching, of course, the whole enlightenment process is described in negative language to stop all sankharas. And even in the Yoga Sutras, Patanjali describes yoga as chitta vritta nirodaha, ceasing all modifications and changes of the mind. See, this is the active principle. This is how one reaches self-realization. This is the method of approaching enlightenment. This is really the subtext of Aparokshanabhuti. And we'll get to the step-by-step -step method in later sections. But right now, we want to establish that the reality is Brahman. It's not any of the modes of material nature or anything related to it. So we have to realize Atman, which is the real self. And because in the Upanishads, Atman is revealed as absolutely identical to Brahman. So when we realize that, then there are no more secrets. There is no more mystery. Everything is clear. Everything is revealed. There is no more knowledge to be gained. There is no more quest for liberation. Liberation is attained. And that is easy because we are already Atman. We are already Brahman. All we have to do is remove the different coverings that keep us from seeing that, from recognizing it. <clears throat> so yoga is actually a negative process, a process of removal of obstacles. Because what we are seeing through the senses is but a dream. And the proof that it's a dream is that it changes. That the waking world disappears when we enter sleep. And that the dream world disappears when we enter deep sleep. And even that changes, and the dreams and the outer world come back again. And this outer world, even though it tries to convince us that it's real, <laughs> it tries its best, still we see that it's constantly changing. What's true today is not true tomorrow, and vice versa. So if that's the case, how can it be real, absolutely real? It's not. Its reality is only relative, in the same way as the reality of a dream is only relative, and for the same reason, that it's not persistent, it's not eternal. So maybe the outer dream appears to be a little more persistent than the nightly dreams. 
but it's still impermanent, unsatisfactory, and not self. And this is the cause of the existential dilemma of human existence, that we seem to be a, a conscious entity in a body, in a material world, and then we have to live up to the values and expectations of that world, or we're judged uh, that we're not making the changes. <laughs> we're not good enough. But this is completely backwards. Uh, this is an incompatible situation where the self, which is the reality of everything, comes under judgment for not having certain material qualities and whatever. <laughs> Completely backwards. It's the other way around. The body, the senses, the mind, and the world exist within consciousness. And again, the proof of that is when consciousness changes, it all disappears. So the quest then is to realize that consciousness that never changes. What kind of consciousness is that? Turiya. Turiya is consciousness of consciousness. Like if somebody says, are you aware? Are you conscious? We say, oh yes, of course. Though that awareness of awareness, that consciousness of consciousness is Turiya. And since we are always conscious of our consciousness, we're always already in Turiya. Just that these other things have become add-ons. These other states, these temporary states. So the whole point of meditation and the whole goal of self-realization is to remove these extra states. You know, that's why sages, when they reach enlightenment, they like to go naked, or as naked as possible, uh, like Ramana Maharshi and many others in India. Because what is, it's a symbolic gesture that one has removed all the artificial coverings of the self. One has realized the naked truth, the essence, the reality. And from that state, there's no going back. It's full of bliss. It doesn't require any outward object for happiness because its nature is blissful. And also, it doesn't change. It's always on 24 hours a day, <laughs> seven days a week, 365 days a year. And it is who we really are. So when one reaches that state, one never returns to the state of illusion. Even though apparently the body is still there, apparently the mind is still functioning. But that is only a function of the prarabdha karma. And in the Upanishads, actually in Vedanta Sutra, it's described that even that is really just illusory. And it's given as an explanation to people on lower stages of self-realization. But actually, one who realizes Brahman is completely free of all karma, whether past, present, or future. They are completely free, and they can do anything they like, and there's no karmic reaction. But this is not to be abused. We see a lot of people who claim to be enlightened and then do all kinds of nonsense and say, oh, well, it's, that's just my enlightenment, my leela, you know. No, no. One who is truly enlightened lives a holy life. The reason for that is not that he has to, but to serve as a good example for others, to show the path to show the way to complete enlightenment by 
letting go of all the different sense desires because these are all temporary. They're so fragile. One day they come and the next day they're gone and it's like they never existed. So try to understand not to be attached or not to regard these things as important. They're just waves on the ocean of consciousness. Consciousness is everything. And these different apparent changes that we experience are simply illusion. So that's the message. That's what Aparokshanubhuti is telling us. And we should take this very seriously and take the time to sit down and consider it, meditate on it, and realize it, because this is the path to authentic enlightenment. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung.